Zippity doo da, zippity a. My oh my, what a. I can't finish that sentence off and be honest. I'm supposed to end it with wonderful day, but <laughs> I can't remember last time I had a wonderful day. <clears throat> My poor dear mother would say, You're so negative all the time. It's like, yes, I'm stressed out all the time. I never get a day off. <laughs> I'm going to edit that out of this video. You know, no one has to see that. No one has to see that salty little rant I did before making this video. Note to self, edit that part out of this video. <laughs> I want to make a, an important, uh, and of all the countless, and there has to be at least like 2,000 videos I've made on magnetism, defining magnetism, people still don't get it. I've simplified it about a million different ways, but I've noticed I've not addressed this topic very simply and directly before. And it's highly important. I was talking about this last night in live stream. People were like, oh, you should make a video about this. this is, I really get it. It clicks. And when things click, it's like, wow, I stumbled upon something. And uh, when I actually talk in loose form and live stream, I'll uh, make uh, blatantly uh, simple statements that uh, click in people's minds such that they can understand things. And I actually like that. I traveled to Utah and gave a lecture on magnetism. It was a huge success. Everybody loved it. And I was uh, lucky. I, I didn't get paid a penny for that, by the way. <laughs> I didn't get paid a penny. It was like a miserable trip. Flew out to Washington, then over to Idaho. But I, I loved uh, the lecture that I gave, and I loved talking with people on uh, field theory. Um, but one of the most important things, and that's what this video is about, is talking about space and capacitance. Human beings, of course, we all, and the reason why human beings, and this is not about black holes, can't understand a black hole because we don't have an analog here on Earth that actually can explain it rather simply. And we also, too, don't have an analog because nobody's taught field theory growing up is like a larger box will hold more stuff, right? You have a bigger trunk at the foot of your bed, and it'll hold more stuff. And bigger, of course, is more. Bigger is better. And people, of course, confuse power with um, force. And force is not power by definition, especially regarding field theory, but rather the opposite of power. And then we, of course, think of power as the giant mushroom cloud from a, a nuclear blast going off, but that's the impotency of power. True power, of course, would be that softball-sized lump of fissionable uranium or plutonium, you know, just this innocent yet radioactive ball sitting there, pure potential. And uh, the same is true of gamma radiation, and the same is true of magnetism, because all of Mother Nature follows this simple uh, fact, and I like to give you a couple examples here with a couple little visuals is that the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. I don't know if you know the actual volume of infrared radiation. It's quite enormous. Uh, the actual frequency of infrared radiation, the wavelength is, I mean, it's a huge uh, bit of, uh, and of course, all light and all fields are ether perturbation modalities, specifically the coaxial circuit that is light, infrared light has an enormous footprint, say the footprint of an elephant. Yet the stuff that is highly dangerous and highly wicked, gamma radiation, for example, I mean, has the footprint of a mosquito, which is basically no footprint of all. Imagine the footprint in the sand of, a, of an elephant and the footprint in the sand of, of a mosquito. Maybe one grain of sand could possibly move, if that. And yet the, the disparity between those two, between infrared and gamma radiation, is infinitely more so. What does this mean? I'll get to it in here in a second and actually bring up magnetism and talk about this fact. And then we can actually understand things better. And of course, people need to flush it out of their head. The distinction between um, energy or true power and that of force. Magnetism is the force vector. There's the conjugate geometry. I've talked about this endlessly, of course, in the universe between the dielectric and the magnetic. The actual geometry of the dielectric is a hyperboloid or an hourglass shape. The actual geometry of force and motion, i.e. centrifugal divergence, i.e. magnetism, is of course the torus. By the way, and it's nearly a perfect paradigm, a mushroom cloud from like a, a nuke going off, he, of course it rises up, let's say it's a mushroom cloud. The reason why it rises is of course superheated air, all hot air of course rises, I and mean, of course it has that stock of the disturbed uh, ground and dust and whatnot, but I mean, other, if you take away the stem, you actually have a huge torus 
of the release of that energy, of that softball-sized lump of uranium or fissionable plutonium, you have a large torus. The release of that energy manifesting as power, but that's not energy at all. The smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. The reason why gamma radiation is so incredibly small is because the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. What would then be the analog of magnetism? And let me take a look at a typical magnet underneath the ferrule cell. And I have a red, red box drawn around it, which you can certainly ignore. The actual uh, dark center there, of course, you're looking, if you look down on a, on a uh, cross section of a, an hourglass, you know, looking down to the point where it actually constricts right there in the neck, is a certain size and also to the size of the constrictor where the sand grains fall right through it. You're looking actually at the interface of the hyperboloid or looking down on the hyperboloid, and that's the dielectric. Everything else around here where we see these lines, that's constructive and destructive interference between the magnetic and the dielectric. Now, magnetism is the dielectric field. That would be no different than saying the mushroom cloud of a ball of uranium is the field of that uranium or plutonium, i.e. the release of that energy or inertia. The thing that human beings call magnetism is the dielectric field, the loss of that energy or inertia. Yes. So here's a typical like N38 or N40 Gauss magnet. Now let's take a look at an N52 Gauss magnet. You can actually see the outline of the physical magnet. Uh, with a black ring around it right over here, you'll see how large that black hole is at the center relative to conventional. So this would be an N38 or N40 Gauss, and this is a uh, N52 Gauss neodymium iron boron. People call me or they email me, and I've talked about this before. They say, oh, I bought some super expensive, very high power magnet, and uh, I have to get it really close to feel the magnetic effect. What would be the reason for that? Remember, the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. A more powerful magnet has a smaller spatial magnetic field around it because power, true energy, is not in the magnetic. It's in the dielectric. This confuses the hell out of people, and yet it is extremely simple. As simple as Mother Nature herself. As simple as the conjugate geometry, i.e. the yin and the yang of the entire universe the magnetic and the dielectric. There is no affecting one without affecting the other. A more powerful magnet is not typified by a larger toroidal magnetic field around it, just the opposite. A more powerful magnet, because magnetism is not power. Let me repeat that again. Magnetism is not power. It is the impotency, the release of that energy or power. That, of course, is what dazzles humanity. The mushroom cloud, you know, the, the toroidal magnetic fields, like when you get two magnets or a magnet piece of steel together, it's like, oh, we can feel the magnetic field. That's what fascinates humanity. But it's so different than intellectual children watching a puppet show. They're fascinated by the silly little puppets, but they have no idea. Most of them don't anyway. There's a hand in the sock puppet, and there's a huge person, maybe someone as fat and as big as me, behind that sock puppet that's behind the scenery there that's guiding the sock puppet. A more powerful magnet has a smaller magnetic field. It doesn't make sense. More power equals more magnetism. Well, what is magnetism? The magnetism is the extrinsic attribute of the dielectric itself. The extrinsic attribute of that hyperboloid, which is the geometry of true energy, of true power. Yes, the opposite or release of that is, of course, the toroid of magnetism. So a more powerful magnet actually has a smaller spatial field around it, but a larger dielectric portal. It's a bit crude to say dielectric portal, but it has a stronger energy potential at its center. That's the reason why this black hole underneath the ferro cell is so large on an N52 Gauss. Very powerful magnet, which is very near the theoretical li uh, limit on uh, permanent neodymium iron borons. And here we have a conventional N38 or N40 Gauss magnet with a small little black hole right there at the center. Yeah, More power translates into this. Smaller magnetic field, but greater dielectric potential. Smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. Why is infrared so voluminous in its wavelength and frequency? Infrared light is absolutely enormous in volume, yet gamma radiation is infinitesimally super, super tiny. Yeah, gamma radiation is the really, really, really dangerous stuff that will wreck your DNA. And it acts like quasi-matter. Yes? It's basically 
it acts almost just like matter. If something is emitting gamma radiation, it passes through an enormous amount of tissue, wrecks your DNA, wrecks your life, give you cancer. You know, it depends on how many rontgens of uh, gamma radiation you get. But that, of course, is a really dangerous stuff. So why is it? Because we all think a bigger box holds more stuff, and it does, but fields work inverse to that. And this is such an important point. You were not taught this in high school. You weren't taught this in Harvard, even. You weren't taught this stuff in Princeton. There's no branch of science that currently has ever defined the word field. What's a field? Well, a field is... Uh, they don't know. They never define the word field. Field's simple. Field's an ether perturbation modality. Very, very, very simple. Mother Nature is a simple hairy armpit chick with muddy feet. It really is that simple. Smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. The realm of fields, that which makes up, of course, the entire universe, because the universe is made up of fields, not particles. And ultimately, too, as I've explained, the reconciliation of light and matter, which is undeniable, ultra, ultra high energy light, way above that of gamma, is matter. All matter is a compound of hydrogen. Doesn't matter if it's argon or gold or silver or uranium, plutonium, whatever it is, is a compound of hydrogen. That simple fact is actually undeniable by any so-called scientist today. They would fundamentally agree to that fact. But what is hydrogen? I've called it humorously hard light or ultra high energy light, and that's exactly what it is. I made a prediction years and years ago that they would discover that super, super high energy light would produce matter. And that discovery was made last year, but I predicted that many, many years ago. So, magnetism is force. It is not power. It is not energy. Sure it is. Magnetism is centrifugal force vector, you know, the toroidal force vector, you know, that human beings are fascinated by, which, of course, driven with a temporal uh, displacement or temporal variable, we gives us uh, energy manifestation because AC generators don't uh, generate power, they manifest power, which is a distinction with a difference. The dielectric is true energy. Gamma is higher potential, but it is smaller spatially. Everything that is spatial is equal to magnetism. Everything that is counterspatial is equal to energy. You can say zero point energy, subspace, zero point, doesn't matter. This, uh, you say ether itself, who cares? Everything is spatial is equal to magnetism, is equal to the impotency, release of energy. Everything that is true energy is extremely small spatially. There's energy and there's release of energy. Energy is dielectric, ether, counterspace, subspace, zero point. Who cares what you call it? It doesn't make any difference to me. Mother Nature certainly doesn't care. Everything regarding light in its spatial footprint is no different than magnetism and the dielectric. A low Gauss magnet has a huge magnetic field. A high Gauss magnet, a really strong magnet, it has a small spatial magnetic field around it. People are like, how about the super expensive, super powerful magnet and I have to get it closer to feel the same magnetic field intensity as I do this low intensity magnet. Doesn't make any sense. It must have got gypped. like you didn't get gypped. You just don't understand what power is. Power is in the dielectric. When power is increased, the toroid of the magnetic field decreases. It would be like you could turn a, a nuclear mushroom cloud backwards, like you had a, a clock and you could go back, backwards and forwards between the softball-sized lump of plutonium and the total release of that energy, which is power. Oh, look at that power. People think that's energy and power, but it's not. It's the release of energy and power. It is the manifestation of energy and power. All energy is counterspatial. And anything that is closer to highest energy is closer to the smallest spatial footprint because spatial is equal to the release of that energy, i.e. the toroid of the magnetic field, the fundamental force vector of the entire universe, of which there are only two geometries. It's not too difficult. You only have to understand this. Yin and yang conjugate geometry of the universe, i.e. the dielectric and the magnetic. It's literally that simple. But we were not taught any of this stuff in high school or college. Yeah. I hope I made that simple. People really like that in the live stream. I didn't explain it with all such details as I've done in this video, but uh, does it make it simple? If you understand the conjugate geometry of the universe and you distinguish power versus energy, true energy, 
And you understand the smaller the space, the higher the capacitance. You understand a great deal of fields. You understand a great deal of nature. Like a seed would be analogous to the dielectric. Yet the giant oak tree would be analogous to magnetism. Remember that old saying, from small things, big things come? You know, if you told somebody 150 years ago, or something, here's this uh, fissionable blow ball of plutonium. It's a little bit bigger than this. Actually, a good bit bigger than this. Not a whole lot, but... From this, you could get a blast that will level, level an entire city. Oh, you're crazy. It's just nitty. It's just, look at that thing. It's about the size of a softball. That's just crazy. Nothing that small could level an entire city. <laughs> You can relate all branches of energy in nature to their spatial or counter-spatial manifestation, from softball-sized lump to enormous mushroom cloud, the magnetic field to the dielectric portal, from infrared's huge volume to gamma radiation's insanely insignificant footprint, but which is incredibly powerful and incredibly dangerous. There's no person on this earth with a half a brain that doesn't acknowledge that, that gamma is insanely wicked, dangerous, potent, life-threatening, on and on and on. Yet it is infinitesimally small. It is ridiculously infinitesimally small compared to infrared. Well, if it's bigger, it's more powerful for objective things, right? Like bulldozers and cars and all sorts of things, that objective, palpable things in nature, you know? Like this bigger lead ball will leave a bigger dent than this small lead ball. All of that's true, but when it comes to fields and when it comes to energy, the smaller the space, the higher the energy or the higher the capacitance, because capacitance and energy are equivalencies as far as nature is concerned. I hope I made this simple. I think I accomplished it. If you like these videos and want to contact me, my email is below. Any donation is always warmly welcome, and that is also, too, in the description below. Let me know if you have any questions. I hope you have a lovely week. I'm sorry I've been so busy these past few days, but I do have four jobs, technically, and I've just been radically busy. Lux Everetas. Thank you.